Hey, I'm John Sherwood, lead minister of the Asheville Church, and I have the great privilege of being able to talk with a couple of my good friends and brothers, uh, Scott Kirkpatrick and Michael Burns. Uh, Michael is a Bible teacher and a minister at a church in Minneapolis, and Scott is a lead pastor of a church in Columbia, South Carolina. And guys, I'm just so grateful to have you on the call today as we uh, dive a little bit further into the dialogue on race relations and uh, this racial discussion uh, that has really just become uh, a really a, awakened national conscious uh, conversation. And I just want to thank you guys for being willing to take the time here today. Thank you. Thank you for having thank us. You. Yep. So um, let's just dive right in, guys. I know that you guys uh, have spent a lot of time in this um, in this uh, context, in this conversation. Um, and uh, Michael, I know that you have written a couple of books. I'll just plug those real quick on the top. You know, uh, first written Crossing the Line, uh, Culture, Race, and Kingdom. And then most recently, All Things to All People, The Power of Cultural Humility. And, uh, you know, obviously you have some uh, experience and research and writing on these topics, and I think really helping from a Christian worldview how to understand race and diversity and inclusion and what that looks like or should look like in the church and practical steps that we can take. I would highly recommend those books. Uh, but I know that you guys have been talking about this conversation a lot lately with a lot of people. I'm sure that there's probably some some fatigue setting in of like, oh, another conversation, you know, like. Uh, feel like a broken record and, and I know even for me I have felt some fatigue of just oh man like trying to find the strength to, to keep going keep engaging keep having the conversation um, and I've wondered at times what that fatigue might be like for different uh, people groups and, and different sets of um, of racial demographics and, and Scott I'd love to hear from you on that I know you mentioned to me offline that you know Oftentimes, it's white people that feel the most fatigued because maybe it's newest to them, but maybe for um, the black community, it's a bit more commonplace, and, and maybe uh, the fatigue is a little different. I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments on that. Yeah, so, you know, the fatigue is something, you know, from, from one point of view, I, I deal with it every day of my life, right? So th that's my context, right? To uh, um, I am an African-American uh, man and uh, in a, you know in a country that historically has been uh, not my best friend and so mm -hmm. um, so from some perspective I, I deal with this every day now uh, from a, either a teacher perspective or you know someone who engages on training people um, you know when events like this uh, that's happened here in the last month or two uh, in America it does put it more on the front burner and uh, so, uh, so we engage in conversations with, with leaders and training uh, those leaders or having conversations uh, with them help, helping leaders to understand the context from, a, from, from an African-American point of view or just, just from a, a, a church leader's point of view. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a team of, um, of leaders around the nation, whether it be you know, church leaders or elders or teachers or even students, students of, of you know, training in sociology or diversity um, to try to equip each other and others to deal with situations like that or like this. And so over the last three weeks, man, I, I've had multiple meetings every oh, day. I'm sure. I'm sure. Every day. And, so let's, uh, let's, let's talk about that for a minute, if I can. Let me, let me just jump in because I, I want to pull in that thread of, okay, why the last three weeks? Like, like nothing new happened, right? I mean, yeah. black people have been dying on the streets, being yeah. filmed for years now. Even some of the same exact phrasing, like, I can't breathe. This isn't yeah. new, but there seems to be, so, so what's happening isn't new, but the way the country, it seems, is responding seems to be very new. Why is that? Why, why now? What do you think is some of the ingredients that makes this different now? Yeah. That's a great question, John. Uh, I think the first thing is timing, right? First of all, I think it's God's timing. Um, and then second of all, I think, you know, the timing of, you know, in the past, we didn't have a pandemic going on, you know, uh, which people are at home right in front of their TV. And some people are looking, you know, looking at themselves and seeing the weakness of just humans. Like mm. humanity is weak. And, 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 you know, this pandemic is really showing that. And so now people are getting, you know, having a chance to look at 
uh, their frailty and mm. does it. I think the second thing uh, probably is, um, you know, coverage or, you know, I think about the, you know, the 50s and 60s civil rights. You know, Martin Luther King was brilliant because he, he positioned the civil rights movement in front of the TV so people mm. outside of America, you know, culture can see what's going on in America. And it mm. took the civil rights movement to another level. Well, the same thing is happening now. If, if um, you know, those situations or those murders wouldn't have been recorded right. for the whole world to see, we right. wouldn't be, you know, having this situation now. We wouldn't be right. going through the difficulties now. But the whole world is seeing a man life you know, expire right before their very eyes. Right. And so the world's eyes are on this. So that's, those are some of the things I think why the timing is, is now. So you talked about, um, you know, the, the media consumption and exposure being greater technology, allowing for people to, you know, record a live version of, of this death that's happened. I mean, so certainly these components are new. Um, there seems to be some hot button phrases in this conversation, right? Things like white privilege and white fragility and obviously D'Angelo's book, White Fragility, that has really skyrocketed New York bestseller, uh, New York Times bestseller list. I think, it's, I think it's the number one download on Audible books right now. And so, you know, Michael, why, why are some of these terms hot buttons? Why are they so controversial? Why, why do they create so much tension while having these types of conversations? Yeah, I appreciate the question. I, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with the polarization uh, of our country and our world right now. We, we literally uh, live in two different worlds. Mm -hmm. um, and that's exacerbated, it's made worse by the, um, <clears throat> the dynamic of uh, social media, uh, digital news. You know, back uh, when, when I was a kid, uh, when Scott was a kid, you know, everybody in a town read kind of the same newspaper, right? And you watched the, the news maybe on the evening and there was only a couple choices. And so everybody was kind of hearing the same uh, reporting. But now there's, it's so diffused and spread and you get customized news and customized everything that it, it creates a gap in worldview. And then uh, the more that there are divergent news sources uh, and streams of thought, the more that people tend to mistrust the, uh, the news media or other news sources, and the more they cling to the one that sort of is an echo chamber of what they believe. And mm -hmm. so you get that mistrust in there and that confirmation bias of I'm always hearing what agrees with my worldview and what right. continues to move it. And so it, it creates a situation where you have one, uh, I think, portion of society that hears words like white privilege, white fragility, things like that, and goes, yes, of course, that's true, it's obvious. Um, and here, here are the stats and the stories and, and you know all the pundits that are agreeing with it and laying it out, and that's all I ever hear. Right. And so it, it becomes... Uh, normal for you and I, I don't know if you've experienced this but it's kind of like with me you know I, I take classes I read a lot of theology books and get into that and you get so immersed in that worldview that I'll start talking to you know a regular Christian and forget and you throw out some term right you know like well that, that's catalogical and they're like whoa, whoa, whoa what and you're like do right. you not know the word you know and so it just becomes an assumption and then you have the other side that, uh, you know, here's nothing but um, really maybe a different representation of what those terms mean. And so I think that's, that's a big issue in society right now is we have different meanings for the terms mm. and different camps. And then when they come together, you know, you'll have one group that's using the term racism and meaning the historic uh, system that's been in place from the very beginning that sort of leaves groups of people on unequal ground. But another group interprets it as uh, individual acts of prejudice. 
And mm. so, you know, when someone will say, well, there's, I, I'm not racist. And somebody will say, but you, you are, you feed into the system. They're, they're talking past each other. And so with something like white privilege, um, one group will simply mean when we say that doesn't mean your life wasn't hard. It just means your skin color was not one of the things that added to that challenge. Other people will hear it and be mm-hmm. say, you're saying I got everything handed to me. You're saying I was rich and I had it easy. And, you know, I, I didn't have that, you know, Bill Gates is a kind of privileged sort of person, not me. And so we're using different language, which is really important. I'll just finish with this on this thought. I think when we're having these conversations, it's really important at the beginning to say, if somebody throws out one of those phrases, to really clarify and say, what's your definition of that phrase? Not in a combative way, but let's make sure we're talking about the same thing before we jump into the, an argument mm-hmm. or a disagreement. Let's get our terminology on the same page. You know, that's a really great practical because obviously as everyone is jumping into, oftentimes newly jumping into these conversations, I think it's important to have some ground rules, to have some guardrails on how do we effectively have these conversations? Because, you know, from the Christian worldview, we can kind of assume that most people want to have these conversations effectively. They don't want to do it poorly, but oftentimes we don't know how to do that. So that's a that's a great point to make sure that when we use terms, especially hot button terms or terms that maybe are kind of newer to us in our vernacular or lexicon culturally, that we can use these terms in a way that we understand what each other means. Just asking, hey, what, what do you mean by that? Can you explain that a little bit further? Scott? Yeah. So, you know, I completely agree with what Mike is saying here. Uh, I also say, you know, I tell people, I said, you know, these, these hot button topics, they end the conversation or they make the conversation uh, short. They cut it short because people mm. start to tune out. They don't want to have this conversation anymore. Mm. And, you know, like I said earlier, you know, this has been 400 years in the making. We're not going to fix it in a conversation or two or three. And so you you want to use words and phrases that keeps the conversation going. And these hot button topics, they end the conversation. So, uh, yeah, you can say other things or other words as opposed to saying white privilege or something like that. All right. Mm -hmm. Because the, the key is let's keep the door open so we can have mm. more conversations. I think that's another great John, practical. I, yeah, go for sorry. it. I, no, I was just going to add one thing that, to that real quick. That I, I love what Scott said there. And I think that is uh, an important illustration of that is I've, I've heard um, Christians come to me very frustrated and actually worried and say, you know, I heard a brother or sister say that, for instance, uh, uh, black folks can't be uh, racist. And how can anyone say that? I, you know, and so they get very upset and it's like, whoa, 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 and I've been able you know, to say, well, I'm not sure I would use that term, but when they say that, they're talking about a system of power that's in place. Anybody can be guilty of bias, uh, prejudice, bigotry, discrimination. But so there's an example of using the words in a different way that kind of uh, don't facilitate the conversation, as right. Scott was speaking of, um, but wind up speaking past each other. So. so for Christians, just kind of learning how to engage in this conversation with their brothers and sisters, maybe in their own home congregation, or maybe uh, somewhere else outside, or maybe even people in their own family, right? Learning how to engage in this conversation that maybe for some, or if not many, have just that conversation sort of been silent or just sort of off to the side or under the rug or out of sight, out of mind or whatever it is, understanding that one or two or three conversations isn't going to fix everything and having that expectation and just wanting to be able to keep the conversation going and building rapport and relationship with other people that maybe have a different worldview or different experiences or et cetera, having the conversation continue is so vital. I think that's a great practical as I think about for my own life how I can do that and help facilitate that. Um, so you mentioned, you know, people coming to you, Michael, and, and Christians and, and, and getting, people getting offended or, or, or feeling like, how could people say that? I wanted to ask you guys, like, what are some of the reactions that you're seeing from Christians right now in this cultural moment? The good, the bad, the ugly. 
God, I'll let you start with that one. Okay, maybe not the <laughs> ugly just yet. Let's start with the good because, you know, everybody wants to be encouraged. But I think it's yeah. important for us because it's. I think everybody on here is a Christian leader, right? Like we're shepherding other people. Yeah. And so we do have a, a, a unique vantage point into how it seems like Christians, maybe more generally than a lot of people's perspective, how Christians are responding and handling, how they're handling it well, how yeah. could they maybe be handling a little bit better, et cetera. Yeah, you know, I, I've been I've been extremely proud of many people. Uh, you know, I, I think about my specific church. You know, of course, we can always do more, right? So there's some people saying well, we're not doing enough. You're not talking enough. You're not speaking fast enough. And so, yeah, and they're right. And so, I, I, I let me just say that. But uh, for all in all, I am I'm pleased with how many Christians are dealing with this. You know. Um, you know, black Christians or people of color are, are, you know, expressing their hurt, but not, not in an angry manner, you know, now some are, don't get me wrong. And, you know, it's not a sin to, ang you know, ang you know, being angry, uh, or, you know, anger in and of itself is not a sin. You can sin in your anger, but it's an emotion that God gave us. And so it's a part of us. Uh, and so, um, so people are sharing their anger or their hurt. And what I'm seeing is a lot of grace and compassion. And hey, brother, I'm sorry you feel that way. Tell me, tell me, tell me your story. And people, we're hearing people share their stories. You know, um, I had a, you know, I was, I was in a pretty dark place when this thing happened, um, not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago. And I had a white friend, a white elder, elder call me and say, man, I'm just, you know, I saw how you were looking in the meeting. I'm just calling you to see how you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that meant the world, like he couldn't fix it. Mm -hmm. You know, he couldn't fix it. But what he did meant the world to me. It brought me to tears because mm -hmm. here it is, a, you know, a brother, uh, you know, a white brother, who, who is thinking about how these events are, are, are dealing, you know, how, I, how they're affecting me. And he picked up the phone and called, and that meant mm. the world for me. And so people, like, so situations like that is happening over and over and over again. So those are the positive things that I'm seeing with Christians. And, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, mm. Does it need to happen more? I'm sure. But, but yeah. I'm very pleased in what I see. Amen. Yeah, and um, if I can just add to that, um, thanks for leaving me the the negative part, Scott. I appreciate that's it. right. No problem. That's right. Time. Go for it, bro. <laughs> Swing away. Um, I I, sh I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have let him uh, receive first. I should have <laughs> chose to receive. But um, no, you know, I I saw a poll uh, in the last day or two that said that 84% of Americans approve of the peaceful protests of the sort of Black Lives uh, Matter element here. And, which is amazing, 84% of Americans can't agree on almost anything. Um, and, and so that, that's pretty stunning. And, I, and I, I think that I see a similar number, maybe it's slightly higher, um, in, uh, you know, in our family of churches, um, where I, I, I've just seen an enormous number of people step up and say, um, you know, the people that have always been passionate about this issue and educated on it are there. They've been there and they're going to be there, uh, you know, and, and, and then you have uh, an enormous number of people who stepped up and said, I didn't hear but I'm listening now mm. and, and I'm, and I'm sorry. And they want to learn, they want to mm. do the right thing. They want it, you know, and they're speaking out. I, I've never seen, if I can be blunt, I've never seen so many white people speak out about racial injustice um, in, in my life or racial issues. But I think then you have a small percentage that I've seen both in the United States and in the church to a degree um, on, on, either end. You have folks who are, you know, maybe on one end who are a little resistant to all this change and this stuff, and they want to kind of hold on to their worldview, and maybe they're still not quite ready to listen. And then you have another percentage on the other end that's, you know, a little more radical, like, hey, let's, uh, we're not doing enough, and we've got to do more. 
and I, I think when, um, this is at least my opinion, you, you guys might have a different opinion, but I, I think when you're uh, in the middle and you have a larger percentage than either extreme, but you're still being criticized by the, I, the two extremes, that's probably a pretty good sign that you're kind of balanced and, and in a good place and you've got the majority of momentum with you, which I think is a, a good thing. So obviously you bring up the point that, hey, you know, many white Christians are saying, hey, I wasn't listening, but I'm listening now. And we talked about that in terms of why now, you know, and, and that's going to be an enigma to a large degree. I think maybe we'll look in hindsight in the future. But, you know, it does feel like uh, even for us in the church that in many ways we're playing catch up with these types of issues and we've not been as proactive as we need to be. So how can we be more proactive going forward? Uh, not only about race relations, but about the world around us in our churches and in our communities. How can we be the city on a hill, the salt of the earth, the people who are meant to bring this restorative, reconciling kingdom to a world around us when we tend to, it feels like, are often playing catch up to what's going on in the world around us? What kind of thoughts do you guys have? Mike, you know, since you said that you didn't want me to go first, <laughs> I'm going to give you a chance to go first now. All right. All right. Fair enough. Um, you know, it, it, it's a great question. And I think uh, Mark Twain once said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things you can look and you can say, okay, after the Civil War, there was really a, a, a period of reconstruction and some years where race relations were really improving in the country. Um, and, you know, they weren't perfect by any means, but things were changing and improving. And then there was a backlash, and some historians call it the Nader period, um, that was very ugly, and a lot of segregation and the rise of the Klan and all that kind of stuff. And then that fed into the civil rights movement. And so if you look at that, we're kind of repeating that cycle. After civil rights, there was some improvement. There were things that changed. And then you had some time of backlash. And, and I think the time periods are shortened in this cycle. Um, and now in response to some of that backlash, the, the thing Scott mentioned that, you know, the video, it was right there. It was up the next morning. We're all sitting in our houses because of coronavirus. And, you know, it was three weeks after Ahmad and on the heels of the Me Too movement. And you know, all these things. And so the tsunami was going to come. And I think, you know, brothers um, like Scott and, you know, others that are friends of ours have been um, visionary and trying to say that this is going to come. Uh, you know, it's it's the pattern of history. This, this time is going to come and the church needs to get out in front of it. We should be leading the way. We mm. should be the city on the hill. Um, and to some degree, we did that. And to a large degree, I think we've gotten lapped in the last, you know, couple of weeks. And, and now we're playing catch up. So how do we get out in front of it? Um, I, I'd love to hear Scott's answer on this, but I think my answer is simply read the Bible. Um, mm. Read the New Testament. Take off um, our defensiveness and our glasses of what we want it to be and the idea that the Bible is solely about how to get our souls to heaven when we die and read, you know, especially Paul's writings, what Paul is doing. The, one of the most prevalent themes in Paul's writings is how are we going to bring these Jews and Gentiles together as one family? He's constantly addressing it. The whole book of Romans is on that. The whole book of Galatians is on that topic. A big part of Ephesians. First Corinthians is dealing with social divisions. Um, it's it's all over the place. And so I think if we, you know, put on, you know, fresh eyes and really take another look and say, wow, you know, the world of the first century had the same sorts of prejudice and tribalism and discrimination and challenges that we have. And they were given the same mission that we have to go make disciples of all nations there's a treasure trove of direction in there mm. will actually work. And I think that's the key is that God's way will work. The world might see the same problems that we do, but their solutions are not going to last. They simply, mm. the world cannot gather the nations 
together. Only God can do that. And so we need to turn to his word. And when we do that, we'll be the city on the hill. So real quickly, like I know a lot of people's questions are resonating towards what can we do? What do I do? What do I do? And here you're touching on this theme of, man, the world is ultimately powerless to do this kind of work. Only God can do this. And we see that work being done ultimately in the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus and his inauguration of this kingdom that we're supposed to be living in and exemplifying, right? But what would you say is the role of Christians in how do they walk in this world, but not of this world? How are they to get involved politically, systematically, programmatically? How are Christians supposed to engage in in, in, in initiating and continuing and helping to flourish this kingdom of God through the means and context of the world around us? You know, are we to just totally pull back and go be monks and hermits in the caves and pull away from society? Are we supposed to run for presidency and try to change it from, you know, the power structures that, that we have in the world around? Like, and I, I know there's this tension there, but what, what kind of advice or input would you give for our brothers and sisters who are struggling in, in these, some, some of these questions? So, so yeah, me... before, before Scott talks, I'll just say I was, I was there about two days ago. I was about ready to go get a cave and uh, <laughs> uh, become a monk. And just make sure disciple... you chisel, chisel one out for me too, okay? Yeah, Scott, Scott discipled me out of that. So I'm, I'm grateful <laughs> for that. But Scott, go ahead, man. Oh, you crazy, Mike. Uh, <laughs> no, but let me, let me uh, answer your first question, John, right before that, that last question, okay? Um, so, you know, I think, um, you know, what Christians should do. First of all, you know, I, I, I had a conversation a few weeks ago with this brother who uh, his posture in this situation blew me away. Like, I, I know this brother has cried in the past before me, but not, he's not a crier right? In my opinion, right? So I won't put his name out there. But in talking, and this is a white brother, but in talking about this situation, all the recent events that's happened, he could barely get through the conversation because he was crying so much. Mm. And I'm telling you, it moved me to a point where I, I felt guilty as a black man not being as emotional as this guy was. I'm like, mm. my goodness, you know, I should be a little bit more emotional than I've been. Although I've been crying as well, but not nearly. And so when I walked away from that conversation or when I when we hung up the phone, I just had to meditate for a second because I'm like, man, this is the heart that we're supposed to have. Like when Jesus, you know, he when he wept over Jerusalem, mm. I mean, he was just broken over Jerusalem in their heart, heart, not repentant and things like that, it made him weep. And I'm like, this is the heart that we have to have in situations like this. And so the first thing I think is in order to really make a change, we have to have that type of love for our brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Second of all, that type of love for the world, like the world and the state of the world should make us weep. Right. It, should, it shouldn't get me like, you know, I've been angry. I've been, you know, sad. And uh, yeah, I need to, those things are fine, but has it made me weep? And to a point where I'm like, man, it's, something's got to change. So I think the first thing is getting the heart of God when it comes to this perspective. The second thing I think is stop being cowards. Mm -hmm. Getting to a place where it's okay with being uncomfortable. The reason why we don't have these courageous conversations is because we are cowards. And we gotta stop being cowards and get to, especially if we're Christians, and get to a place where it's uncomfortable, you know, somewhat. Jesus right. hung on the cross. It couldn't get any more uncomfortable than that, right? So right. we need to, you know, and so then lastly is the thing that's missing in this whole paradigm is the the lack of the voice of the disciple. You hear the police, you hear the protesters, you hear the government, you hear every voice except the voice of the disciple. And, and Jesus tells us, you are the light of the world. And so the, it will, the world will not be changed or saved unless your voice is heard. And so those are the things I think. 
So I was talking to a dear friend of mine, another African-American minister uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, and we were having a dialogue about some of these things. And he said something that was so profound to me. It was very similar to what you just said. He said, you know, for disciples, as Christians, if we're not, if we're having this conversation, if we're dialoguing about this for very long, and we somehow don't make our way to the foot of the cross, we have missed something. You know, that the ultimate injustice, the ultimate oppressed suffering, the ultimate, if somehow as Christians, we don't bring that narrative into this conversation, we're, we're missing something. We're, we're perhaps being very much led astray by these other voices, these other narratives. And that's something that I'm honestly very concerned about. As I think about my role as a spiritual shepherd and as a spiritual leader, I don't want people to get even subtly swept away by the narratives of the world. And it's very easy in times like this when there's so many narratives and they're so loud. You know, like you said before, we've got, we're inundated with streams and media and live feeds and all these divergent narratives, but the ability to discern which one of those narratives lines up with the narrative of God, I think comes back to what you were saying, Michael, is so important is that we've gotta be people of the word. We are going to miss God's will and God's desire and how to move forward if we're not allowing his narrative of humanity and ultimately this kingdom of reconciliation to be able to help us discern the other narratives that we're getting exposed to. Maybe like never before in history, we're being exposed to more narratives than ever. You know, as you mentioned before, Michael, like before we kind of all had one or two news cycles we all got the same story, got the same narrative. We were all sort of living under a very similar worldview. And that those days are gone. I don't think they're ever coming back. And uh, I think Christian people are in real jeopardy here of not being uh, the people of the, being the city on the hill. And so, Scott, did you want to say anything about this, this question about, you know, how do we engage in the world around us politically? Do we protest? Do we run for office? Do we just go get caves next to me and Michael, you know, in the desert somewhere. Like, like what, what, what would you say is, is some guiding principles for a Christian's approach to some of these things? Yes. Uh, you know, like the first thing I, I mentioned about uh, making sure that our hearts are in the right place, right? That we want to imitate God's heart in justice, you know? Mm -hmm. And so second of all, I, you, you, your voice needs to be heard, like verbally say something, you know, mm. whether it's going to a person that is in pain and say, I'm sorry. Um, uh, thirdly, write your governor, uh, write and call the senator or the mayor, you know, and, uh, and then fourthly, like you can do that, but it's going to take a minute for policy to take place, right? It takes, it's a process. But what we can do is go uh, to where people are. Proximity is important. So, mm. um, you know, engage your, your police department. Uh, you know, take lunch to the police officers. Uh, go to the police department and pray over them mm. or pray for them. Um, because what happens is, you know, uh, like we, when we start to change people's hearts, that's when change actually happens. Mm. And so, you can't, you can't fight, you know, I think uh, Martin Luther King said, you can't fight evil with evil. You know, mm -hmm. only, only you can fight it with, with good and with love. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, we need to love, right? And I know sometimes that goes against our every being. Like right mm -hmm. now, I want to just lash out. No, mm -hmm. but as Christians, this is the time that we mm -hmm. figure out how can I bring love to this situation? So engage your people, the, the police, engage uh, people that, that set policies mm. and, uh, and make a difference that way. Yeah, if it is your right to, to, to march. Uh, mm. I've done it before. Um, I, I, I think it has to be peaceful. Uh, anything that's unrighteous is unrighteous. And right. so, but people protest, I think it's fine. I mean, that's our constitutional right. I think we have to be wise <laughs> though, when you have to do mm. things like that, right? Because mm. Everybody at peaceful protest may not be peaceful and you mm. won't get lumped into it. So just wanted to share yeah. a couple of those things. Thank you, Scott. Michael, what would you say to that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I, 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 at the risk of sounding like I'm putting in a plug, um, 
I spent the last two years working on that that very question. Um, how do we engage as disciples? When should we and all of that? And so actually on, on June 30th, uh, so, you know, less than three weeks here, uh, I have a book coming out called Escaping the Beast, Politics, Allegiance, and Kingdom. And the, the first half of that book is uh, first getting straight in our minds what the kingdom is and what that demands of us. And to, to your point, John, and the point uh, that your friend mentioned the other day, there's a, a whole chapter in there called the, the Kingdom of the Lamb and really calling us to view the world um, through the lens of having a sacrificial lamb as our king. Mm. And what, what does that mean for us? And uh, so the whole first section of the book is really, we've got to understand the enormity of the kingdom and the allegiance mm. that it's causing, calling us to before we can think about engaging in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a, a second section where we really examine the, the realm of the empires and the nations biblically and what is God doing there? What's our role as kingdom people? What's the role of the nations and, and the role of politics? And then the third section, the last section mm -hmm. of the book is specifically how then do we engage in the world? And I, I try to provide some principles in there of thinking through with our kingdom lens on and how what we understand our role in the world is, how do we engage in uh, social issues, in um, economic justice issues, racial justice issues, sanctity of life, environment, um, you know, law enforcement, war. Uh, those sorts of things. How do we specifically as Christians, how might we think through when to engage, how to engage? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so um, it's that's a bigger for me. That's I, I love Scott's practicals. That's a bigger question than I could mm -hmm. answer unless you want to turn this into a multi <laughs> uh, session right. episode. But right. I'll just say uh, June 30th, IPI book, yes. Escaping the Beast. I try to uh, wrestle with those things. Good. I have and one last thing, John. Please go for it, Scott. Uh, yeah, so I heard this, this illustration, and I, I love it, by, by another church leader. Um, I think one of the biggest things we can do, especially uh, white people, and that is advocate. Uh, so there's an illustration of, uh, you know, just bullying in elementary school, right? He always, you know, he's going around beating up people. And, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, stop a bully from beating, beating you up? Uh, well, you could, you could, you know, uh, go and tell the teacher and, and the teacher can advocate on your behalf. Mm -hmm. That's good. And then that may work. Uh, or you can find a bigger bully to beat him up, Right. Well, if you don't find one, then you can hopefully find someone that is a friend of the bully, right? That is, that can be your advocate. Um, and, and the bully will probably listen to this person. Now the person goes out on a limb, you know, with this, but he goes out on a limb. And Mike, Mike heard about this illustration as well, but he goes out on a limb uh, to maybe voice, you know, on your behalf, I hey mean, stop beating up on that, that guy. But the bully would probably listen to, you know, his peer more than he would listen to the, you know, to the kids he's bullying. Uh, why? Because this peer is now advocating, uh, you know, for the person that really can't uh, advocate for themselves. Mm. And so white people need to be advocates. And we're seeing more of that today. It's like, I'm blown away by some of these protests then I see more white people than I see black people in these protests. And I was like, that is a great trend. Mm -hmm. And so advocate will be another, you know, uh, tool that we mm -hmm. could use to help change. Yes. Uh, especially from a godly point of view, uh, Christian advocates. And sometimes, right. you know, it needs to happen in the church as well. So but this, just wanted to add that last thing, John. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. And obviously, there's uh, only so much that we can tackle in one conversation. We're not going to fix it, right, in our one conversation, or even if we had two or three or 300. Uh, you know, and I think for me, where I land, and, and obviously, as this is getting out to other people and, and other small groups are using this conversation as a springboard for their own conversations, 
what, what I tend to land is that, you know, uh, what we said earlier, that the world is never going to have solutions for certain problems. Only Jesus' death and resurrection can solve certain problems. And those problems that that solves are the ones that are most important. You know, the ministry of reconciliation that Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians, right? That God has given us this ministry that we can be reconciled not only to him, but to one another. And that we want to utilize everything in our power. We want to make the most of every opportunity. But at the end of the day, we want to keep our eyes set on and our hearts fixed on the fact that only Jesus is able to make the two one and to break down the dividing wall of hostility. Brothers, I love you. I'm so grateful for you in my life. May God bless you in all of your work and labor as you minister for him.